Eight police officers were killed during a violent anti-government protest in Sierra Leone on Wednesday. The country's youth minister had announced this. Officers, six men and two women, were brutalized and killed in the area where the protest held on Wednesday. Youth Minister Mohamed Bangura had said this. It was reported that hundreds of protesters took to the streets of the capital, Freetown, protesting inflation and the rising cost of living in the West African country. Youth Minister Bangura described the protest as an act of terrorism. Well, joining us to discuss this uh, is Joseph Smith. Oh, apologies. Um, joining us to discuss this is Abdul Karim Will. He's the Deputy Director, uh, Strategic Communications and Spokesperson, Office of the National Security in Sierra Leone. It's good to have you join us, Mr. Abdul Karim. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Great. It's a pleasure being with you. Thank you. Um, let's start by looking at what exactly um, transpired that led to the deaths of these eight officers. Can you hear me? Are you coming broken? However, if I could get you, I had you asking that I should give you an update of how what happened, happened. Yes. Thank you. I, I am certain you have followed that, you followed on happenings in different parts of Sierra Leone. And you must have seen graphic videos, text messages, and uh, it, pictures making the rounds on mainstream and social media. Uh, they actually depict the carnage that was meted out on the people of Freetown and some parts of the northern region a couple of days ago. Hmm. To say the least, this is very sad. Uh, it's unfortunate and it's totally condemned on the, on the part of the Office of National Security which is a government agency in charge of uh, coordinating the security sector. Well, we, we understand. We are I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I think there's a break between us. Uh, but we understand that this started as a protest against the cost of leaving in the country. Um, because you're in charge of security, I want you to, you know, zoom in on when this became violent. At what point did it become violent so much so that, because I hear that uh, uh, two women were killed in, in an area while they were protesting. It started as a violent protest. Uh, ordinarily demonstrations are ones that should uh, be sanctioned by the Syrian police, which has a responsibility by law to grant people who want to go to peaceful demonstration clients. However, in a situation, uh, a couple of uh, months ago, we had uh, various groupings, especially people from the diaspora, sending incendiary messages, calling on people to come out and take over government. Those were the exact uh, words, if I could uh, and they were even threatening that uh, when they will be coming out to do those demonstrations, if people do not join them, they will be lynched, they will be killed, and the arson committed on their properties if they fail to join. And to us, we, we, that is not the way to ask for a clearance. You do not ask for police clearance via social media. Uh, the law Are you still there, Mr. Abdul Karim? Mr. Abdul Karim, can you hear us? Uh, we lost connection with you for a bit, but can you hear us now? I can hear you now. Yes, you were talking about the law and what it allows. Please go, go over it again. Yeah, the law is 
on demonstrations is with the public act of 1965, specifically section 1712 of that law stipulates that uh, people who want to go into demonstrations must request from the Inspector General of Police in the like stating the purpose and time for their demonstration. And they should not be able to sit with the police to discuss the details of the demonstrations. Uh, this did not happen in the situation. We witnessed a lot of uh, social media messaging, making media calls uh, for demonstrations to come forward and uh, overtake government. Mm. We made deliberate efforts to engage the population, particularly the youth population that was going to be the target, to say if they want to go into demonstrations, it's their democratic right to do so, well, let them do it in the confines of the law. Uh, we did several engagements on radio, television, deep press, all in interest of guiding the process. Mm. But sadly, those people that were making the calls are those that are residing in diaspora and they were calling on gullible groups back home to jump onto the streets without following the process. I'm curious, um, why do you think that this? I mean, because you said there are text messages that were sent that were inciting people to overrun the government, in your words. Who do you think are the, those who are behind it? And, and, I mean, we know what Sierra Leone had gone through uh, over the years when it was at war, and it's finally gradually getting back, you know, some, some level of peace. Um, who are these people you think are behind it, and what do you think that the... Um, the end game is because, I mean, other than saying let's overrun government, that's not something you can do in a day. But um, why do you think now people would want to overrun a government as opposed to uh, engaging government if the cost of living is actually the reason why this protest even started? It is strange uh, to say, to be very honest, it's strange because this issue of cost of living are uh, ones that are being discussed across the board and it is not only affecting one particular region it's the case for all other regions across the country we agree that uh, things are difficult and we all appreciate that one but in the process of going into demonstration in advocating for a change in the conditions of living you have to do so with the decisions of the law and the demonstrations were not uh, Characteristics of what you consider demonstration, because the calls were for the overthrow of government, for the burning of down of government vehicles, and uh, the calls were coming specifically, like I've stated, from people who reside abroad, and a few others who are in country made conscious efforts to inform the youth to tell them that, contrary to the law, they should not ask for permission; they should go on and and protest. And so, on the 8th of uh, August, uh, there were attempts in, in overrunning government officials, especially security forces. On the 9th, same occurred, but we were able to pacify the situation. But the incident calls continued coming, and uh, unfortunately, a number of youth jumped into the street, particularly of the town. And then three other districts, we have to clean uh, districts in the country. So we had these protests happening in three towns, some parts of three town, and three other districts in the northern region. Uh, we became concerned, and uh, officers initially had deployed a strategic positions on hand because we wanted to assure the public that uh, we are there to provide for their safety and security. Uh, and the approach was a kind of uh, one with a human face, not to intimidate the public, but to allow those people that uh, wanted to go about their normal business to do so unhindered. But sadly, uh, the youth came out, they had machete, and, uh, they had t shirts on, and all of these were indicating that they wanted the president to go. Okay. All efforts to pacify them 
of do things within the confines of the law fail. Uh, uh, again, um, talking um, about the law here, because the, I, I know that you're a government official and, of course, you'll be speaking as a government spokesperson. But then, if you have laws, I'm guessing that when it comes to protest or riots, um, there has to be a modus operandi. Is shooting at or battering um, these protesters part of the rules of engagement in terms of rioting because you're not in a war situation? But we saw, you know, videos of officials or officers shooting uh, at people. Is that supposed to be part of what you do, especially in trying to douse tension? No. no there are rules of engagement. If protesters are unarmed, if protesters are not violent, if, you not, if they do not pose a threat to others and they do not pose a threat to national security, nobody is allowed to shoot at them. But remember, I just told you that the, the protests did not start as peaceful ones. Uh, they were well calculated. Uh, ordinarily, demonstrators should carry, carry placards. They should not be armed. They should not have much machetes, and all of those kinds of things. Are there no and other Are there no other ways to disarm these people? people? I'm so sorry to talk over you. Are there no better ways to disarm these people? Rubber bullets, um, you know, water canisters, something, instead of using live rounds and ammunition. Yes, I agree. There could have been better way of handling it if 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 the situation has yet not degenerated. By the way, I'm not the government's spokesperson. I speak for the Office of National Security, specifically for the security sector. And what I'm telling you is from a serious point of view, because even before we reached this point, we made conscious effort, to, say for the past two weeks, to engage on very robust public campaign to pacify the public, that uh, if you want to engage in a, in a peaceful demonstration, then please come see to the police and design a way. But because of the incident calls that we are making the rounds, and because the motives were away from were different from demonstrations, people did not adhere to that. All of a sudden, we began to see, we witnessed seen where police officers have been brutally murdered. Some were not even in deployment, they were coming from different assignments, and they unfortunately came into those kinds of schools and they were killed. If situation began to deteriorate at that level, then you 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 witness things that uh, you just talking about. It is unfortunate that was why we made also enormous efforts to call on moral guarantors opinion leaders, not to keep quiet in the midst of all of this. But sadly, most of them did not say a dime. They did not help us in the campaign to pacify the youth. They kept quiet. And now, following the carnage that has been wrecked on the people of Freetown, we are now seeing all sorts of press releases uh, 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 calling for calm, uh, uh, wanting to buy dialogue platforms, where parties will be engaged. And then when the demonstrations themselves are influenced, they have not told us who the people are. Then you say uh, young Sierra Leoneans, I will agree, but uh, there is no leadership. Uh, we just saw people in Britain and the target, uh, their targets were government officials, including our security personnel. A number of them have been killed, of course, some other civilians. Civilians have also been killed. Uh, unfortunately, for a country that just emerged from a brutal civil conflict, you would expect people to have lived in a way that is different from this uh, way we have done things. Uh, That's sad. Again, I know that you're not a government spokesperson, but you obviously live in that country and you know how things are done. Um, talking about peaceful strategies and um, um, dialoguing. Of course, you need to know who you're dialoguing with or who you're on the table with to have this conversation. But of course, the people also um, need to be spoken to in a manner that makes them feel that the government cares. Because whether we like it or not, there are some other issues at the root of this 
protest that turned into a bloody one. If people are, are, are not happy necessarily, uh, if people are not happy with what's happening uh, in the country, there obviously has to be a way that they register that displeasure and it has to be through protest. But I think Joseph Smith, who is a Rotary Peace Fellow, just joined us. So I'm, I'm going to toss that um, question to you, Joseph. Joseph, um, do you think that the Sierra Leonean government has been have paid a listening ear to the plights of the people even before this time? And we're not in any way saying that, you know, um, mayhem is the way to go, but could this have been managed in a different way other than what we see on our screens right now? Joseph, can you hear me? Yes, hello. Yes, yes. All right, go ahead. Yes, say again, please. I'm, I'm getting you broken. Can you can you? <clears throat> All right, I'll try again, Joseph. Can you repeat? Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm asking, as a Sierra Leonean, knowing yeah. that this the the protest which turned violent, um, had at the core of it people registering their displeasure about the cost of living and the economic situation in the country. I'm saying how um, attentive and listening has the government of Sierra Leone been to the people? And could this have been managed better other than what we see right now? If the violence is serious in free time, Oh, I don't think that you can, can hear me. I can hear you clearly. I don't think you can hear me, but I'll try again. Could the government of Sierra Leone have handled this situation better? And how listening um, is the government? How listening is the government? Yes. Yeah, um, I think in the first place, I want to say that the crisis that occurred in Freetown and some parts of the north, specifically in Maboka, Makini, and Kamakue, are basically based around three factors. One is the social, economic, and political factor. You know, what are we say around the social economic aspect from the demonstrators, uh, the alleged well. We are also reunions. We are feeling the same pain together. And some of the social and economic issues that the demonstrators were emphasizing on, these are all basically not new things. We have been experiencing them uh, for, since the end of the war. Uh, but what is important here to know is that um, the motivating factor for, for people to come out from the street is basically lie around politics, political motivation. And uh, this is why if you observe the, the situation is happening within mainly the stronghold, uh, the stronghold of the opposition party. So, okay. hello? I can hear you, I can hear you. Are you getting me? Yes, I clearly? can hear you. Quickly, Joseph, because we're out of time, yeah. unfortunately, you really can't hear me. What must the government of Sierra Leone do to douse this tension, knowing that it's most, more of, being, more of pol political and, of course, economic? How can they douse this tension, other than using brute force? Uh, it's like you are beat a, a, a far a bit from the microphone. I, I'm not getting you clear. I think, I think that we have a connection problem with, uh, with you, but I'll try one more time because we're out of time. Um, how can the government of Sierra Leone deal with this issue other than using brute force? Unfortunately, I think that uh, Joseph is uh, having connection issues um, in uh, Sierra Leone. But I want to say thank you. Joseph Smith is a Rotary Peace Fellow and a mining consultant. And Abdul Karim Will uh, is the deputy, um, he's the deputy spokesperson for uh, the security department in uh, the direct, he's the deputy director, I beg your pardon, strategic communications and spokesperson of the Office of the National Security in Sierra Leone. Thank you so much, gentlemen. The internet connection has not been so great, but we appreciate you for being part of the conversation. Being with you.
Thank you. Well, that's the show tonight. We want to thank you all for being part of the conversation. But before we leave you, we'd like to bring you an update of all the conversations we've had all through the week. I'll see you next week. Have a great weekend. I am Mary Anacom.